Good morning. Um, I'm just checking that you can all hear me and we're all all right. And then I'm actually going to um, get rid of the video, I think, for everybody. So can you all hear me? Yep. Yeah. Good, good, good. Okay. So I wonder how I do that. Um, Um, hmm. I'm looking for an overall control to turn everybody's video off, but I'm not having a lot of luck. Oh. Oh, well, not to worry. We'll get started anyway. Um, I wonder. Okay. All right, we'll just we'll just get started. Um, and then at the end, I'll actually I'd actually quite like to have you all videoed. Let's have you all on the video. Can I, um, can I get you to do that? Then I can see your lovely faces. Otherwise, I can't see your lovely faces. And I was a bit worried there'd be way too many people here because a lot of people registered for this. And um, hello. Um, yeah, this is much nicer. Yeah, t turn your video on if you can. Um, and then, then we can see you as well, which is great. Then I'm talking to somebody rather than myself, which is much better. And then at the end, we can do Q&A. You can all get your uh, microphones on and we can have a chat. All right. So this morning we are talking about like the most important thing, which is um, the the step-by-step -step sort of foundation work. Now, uh, people have different ideas about what foundation training is. For me, foundation training is being able to control the horse up to sort of lateral work. So up to and including basic lateral work. And there isn't any real definition of foundation training. So what I want to be able to do is make sure that the horse is safe to ride. And I feel that if I have control of the nose, the front feet and the back feet, then I'm, I'm pretty much there and I'm pretty happy to ride that horse. So that for me um, is what constitutes foundation training. The, with the Kandu Equine system, I've, I've set it up so that it works progressively through these levels. And you'll see in the diagram that goes with this webinar, um, everything is founded in relaxation. So we've got to start with relaxation. If we don't have relaxation, there's no point in progressing. There's no point in even starting. So, you know, if you, if you get the horse that is emotionally up here before you even go to put the saddle on or before you even go to put the head collar on, you're not going to get anywhere really. Well, you might, but you're, you're not going to get any, anything solid on that horse, anything that is probably repeatable. So while you might be able to achieve something in the moment, you're not going to be able to repeat that, which is what's so important. So it is so important to start with relaxation. Now, one of the things I get told is, oh, a step-by-step -step approach. Well, you can't do that because all horses are different and, you know, all horses are individuals. Yes, of course they are. Of course they are. But what we need is a, a system that you can apply to any horse. So what we need is to be able to say, right, this is the, this is the lesson we need first. And once we've got that, we can then teach something else. Now within each of those lessons, we can break that down as much as we need to for each individual horse. And each horse is gonna be different. You know, one horse 
you might not need to break things down much at all. Um, another horse, you might have to break them down into tiny, tiny pieces. I remember with a Brumby once, I had two Brumbies at the same time. One was just terribly relaxed and everything, you know, took about two minutes. So every lesson, was really fast learner, it was great, absolutely fine. The other one that I had got at the same time and had the same experience with was much older and he obviously had more life um, events happened to him which weren't good perhaps and and everything with him I had to progress millimeter by millimeter so even touching him the first touch I touched him on the rump the first time and I progressed up to his head millimeter by millimeter whereas the younger one I just touched him sort of um, anywhere and, and I just went along like that and you know the whole horse within five minutes was absolutely fine. So they will vary. And mostly it's just going to be a matter of how much you need to break down a lesson for a particular horse. You don't need to change the lesson. You don't have to reinvent the wheel every time you get a new horse or every time you come across a different horse. You just need to know how to break the lesson down to suit that horse and the speed with which the horse can take the lesson in as well. You know, some horses might learn it in five minutes hips to the fence is a great example some horses might learn that in three minutes some horses might learn it in three sessions and usually that's going to depend on the horse's emotional level um, and experience with um, pressure release of course so horses that are very experienced with pressure release tend to catch on pretty quickly um, horses that are not so experienced with that they're also learning pressure release at the same time so that's why I use pressure release as my very first um, lesson. That's why I use give to the bit first, because give to the bit is a really simple pressure release um, lesson. And what it does is it introduces the horse to the concept of pressure release. So what happens with the horse is over time, the horse learns that its job is just to find an answer in movement to a particular pressure. And we start, I start with give to the bit, but it might just be give to the head collar. It might just be give to pressure. Um, the reason I start with give to the bit as opposed to move your head laterally to a head collar pressure or any other sort of pressure is that the bit work is useful for other things. So where I can, I really like to have an exercise or have a lesson. If I'm going to spend time teaching it, I want it to be useful for something else. That's why I don't teach my horses to lie down, you know, unless I need them to lie down. Like for, I have done that in the past for a disabled rider, so for her to get on, but it's just not a very useful lesson to me. So unless I can use it under saddle, I'm not particularly interested in teaching it. A lot of people ask me, you know, when I teach hips to the fence, I also teach side pass. Um, they say, oh, do you do that on both sides? And I don't because side pass on the ground is just not a terribly useful exercise for me. So I don't bother. Um, not to say you can't, but just something I don't bother doing. So I do like things to have um, a use under saddle because that's what I love doing. I love groundwork, it's great. But you know what? I wanna be on the horse. I always, I'm always mentally riding the horse. It doesn't matter whether I'm teaching the horse hips to the fence or I'm teaching the horse flying changes or I'm long riding. I'm mentally riding the horse all the time that I'm on the ground. So they've got to be useful exercises. So that's why I start with give to the bit. It's the, it's the basis of engagement. Um, so, you know, if you want the horse's attention, what it does is it gets the horse into the engagement zone. Now the engagement zone, I talk a lot about that sort of bubble of communication where we're, I'm in that bubble with the horse and we're safe and we're talking to each other. And the horse is engaged with me, meaning it's concentrating on me. And the give to the bit gives you that lovely, round, soft horse. And you can sort of see the bubble, can't you? You can, you can really see that shape of that bubble with the horse. And when the horse does put its head up and pricks its ears and looks at something over in the distance, the bubble bursts. And it's really obvious to you because it's you know, the horse goes like this with his ears and the bubble bursts and you think, okay, let's get you back in the engagement zone. So it's a, it's a very easy thing for you to be able to conceptualize, I think as well, which is very helpful. Um, it's often the horse's first introduction to pressure release. Now we all talk about pressure release and a lot of horses um, 
might have been trained with some pressure release, but we're not always very good at using it. But actually, we're not always very good at releasing. We're usually quite good at pressure, not always very good at releasing. Now, it's all very well to say pressure release, but it doesn't really mean much until you explain exactly how it works. So what we want the horse to, to understand is that the pressure will go away and all completely gone when the horse finds the correct answer in movement. Okay, so, you know, this, this might be, um, if we're just talking about give to the bit, all we're doing initially, the only movement we want, and you have to have movement, the only movement we want is for the horse to move its nose laterally. So just move its nose to the side a little bit. So what we're going to do is we're going to pick up some pressure on one rein, let's say the left rein. We're going to wait until the horse comes off that pressure by moving its nose to the left, and then we're going to release that pressure, all of it. Um, and the horse learns, oh, okay, so I feel this pressure, I move my nose, it goes away, and I get praised. And so that, that's pressure release, okay. So it's very important that we get that release right. Now, quite often when we start with this lesson, it's the first time the horse has been introduced to well-used negative reinforcement. So it's the first time the horse actually starts to get a full release when it makes the correct movement. So it's a very important introduction to the horse because from here, with everything we teach, we progress with this really systematic pressure relief. You feel a pressure, you move something in one direction, and I'll release it. Now it is very important, this whole movement thing, we need movement to train. And this is a conversation I've been having with people recently um, about you know, teaching stop for example. Now, I can, you can teach your horse to stop, but you can't stop your horse from moving. And it's a, it's a really important distinction to make because I, can, I want to work with the horse. I always want to work with the horse. We have to think about the difference between um, pressure release, which is negative reinforcement, and punishment. Now, anything you're using pressure release for a negative reinforcement, it's when you want to make a behavior more likely to occur in the future. So with give to the bit, when we pick up pressure, in the future, when we pick up pressure, we want the horse to give to that pressure. We want the horse to soften in the bridle. So that by doing that and releasing at the right time, we're making that behavior more likely to occur in the future. Okay. Let's say we're asking the horse to stop and the horse then walks forward, we're gonna to have to get the horse to go back to where it was. And so we're gonna do that by asking the horse, by correcting the horse, asking the horse to move backwards. Now, that's um, a behavior that we want to happen less likely in the future. So we don't want that behavior. We don't want the horse walking forward. So we're going to correct it by moving it back and that will make the behavior less likely to occur in the future. Correction is the same word for punishment. Okay, so it's exactly the same thing. We have to be aware of what it is we're doing. The only difference between correct, correction and punishment is our perception of how severe that might be. So or the, what I'm saying is that the correction is um, something we do to make a behavior less likely to occur in the future. Now we know that punishment doesn't work well with horses. You know, it's something we have to use. We do use it from time to time, but it simply doesn't work well for horses. So where we can, we really want to work on negative reinforcement and pressure release and positive reinforcement, of course, you know, in the form of praise, adding anything, praise, a pat, scratch on the weather, all of those things. And, and keep it as simple as we can for the horse. So let's say you, if you do want to teach the horse to stand still, which is an important thing to learn, if you do that working with the horse, the thing to do is to get all the movement first, because the only thing you can do is you can force the horse to move its feet. So I can always make the horse move and I can make the horse move in frame. I can make the horse move softly. I can make the horse move in self carriage. I can teach it all these things. And then I can offer the horse the opportunity to stop. That's all I can do because I can't stop its feet moving unless I put them in concrete. So I can offer it the opportunity to stop. If it takes it, great. 
I said, great. As soon as the horse moves, I'm going to say, okay, we'll go. And I'll work on all my other things that I'm working on. And then I'll offer it another opportunity to stop. If it takes it, I'll say, great. I'll reward it for that. And then as soon as it moves, again, I'll go back to so something else, teaching it something constructive. And that gets me away from having to correct or punish the horse because it gives me always something to be working on that um, uses pressure release, that moves the training forward. And I think that's really important. Um, all right. So <laughs> to get the horse engaged with learning, to get the horse into the engagement zone, are there other exercises that we can use? And there are, um, but I just don't think they're as useful. It's quite interesting. Somebody did an experiment a few years ago um, where they used a, just a pressure release exercise. And what they wanted to do was to see whether you, you, you needed less pressure over time. So it was sort of similar to the one that I did with um, getting the horses to step backwards through a corridor um, where they... Um, with this one, they used one of those pressure meters, like a, like a prod, and they were moving a horse's hindquarter laterally. So they're moving the hindquarter away by prodding it on the hindquarter. And they did find exactly that. They found very interestingly, of course, <laughs> um, the more times they did it, the less pressure they required. In fact, um, towards the end of the le um, lesson, they really just needed to move the prod in the general direction of the hindquarters and the hindquarters moved away. And it was a really nice experiment because they were measuring the pressure required. And I think that's what we often forget is that we should always be working um, for less and less and less pressure. And unless we're aware of how much pressure we're using, we, we don't know, do we? You know, unless you sort of think about that. So I think starting a horse's education with a um, simple pressure release exercise like give to the bit, which is also adding to the horse's softness, the horse's roundness, the horse's lifting of its top line, building top line muscle, and ultimately self-carriage is very useful because it makes us as trainers very aware of how much pressure we're using, which is very important. The other thing, you know, with it is, with this simple lesson, is that um, it controls the horse's emotional level. Now, horses are very emotional animals. They have to be, they're flight animals. They have to be very aware of their environment and they have to be able to react very quickly to things. So their emotions can be quite volatile. Um, and for training, what I find most often goes wrong with training is the emotional level is wrong. You know, the horse is too emotional and therefore it's not relaxed, so it's not learning. Well, the horse is not emotional enough and it's basically asleep and therefore it's not learning both extremes one might sound worse than the other but they're really not because they they mean that you're wasting your time really whatever you're doing you're wasting your time and you're probably boring or frightening the horse so you, you know we need to get this right we need to find that engagement zone and for me the give to the bit exercise has always been the fastest way to get me there um and i have tried other things the various things but the give to the bit exercise because it's so useful for all of the horse's training for the rest of its life. It's just for me, it's just like, oh, I'll just go to that. It's my go-to thing to get the horse re-engaged. So if my horse, if I'm riding along, having a happy old time, suddenly six kangaroos bound out in front of me, which does happen quite a lot here in Australia, the horse's emotional level goes up here. I go, oh, right, simple, give to the bit. As soon as the horse has that, I get right, okay, might need some more shoulder control, I can go to shoulder control. And then if I still need some more attention, I can go straight to hindquarters. And I've got the horse back in my bubble of communication. So um, that's why I start with give to the bit. Um, and as I say, it is useful for the whole education of the horse. Now, it's one of those things, it's what give to the bit becomes and that frame and softness and self-carriage become an automatic response and that's what we're building with our horse automatic responses so that we can layer them we can build on top of that and it's a bit like when you first teach your horse to tie up okay you teach your horse to tie up so that it stands still while you groom or tack up or do whatever you do once your horse has been taught to tie up that's an automatic response isn't it 
um, your horse, you mostly you don't really actually need to tie the horse up because it, it becomes so automatic for the horse that when it's at the tie rail, you can, you know, flop the lead rein over the tie rail, the horse will stand there. Unless your horse hasn't been taught to tie up well, in which case go back and teach it. But, but it becomes an automatic response. And so does everything we teach. And that's the beauty of doing it like this, by building on that strong foundation. So give to the bit becomes an automatic response. And you'll find if any of you have seen like the video of me riding um, the little Palomino quarter horse stallion bareback and bridleless, he travels in frame because frame is an automatic response for that horse. You know, that's what he knows when I ride and I ask him to move forward and my hands are here, whether I'm holding the reins or not, becomes an automatic response. The horse travels in frame. And that's what we're looking for because once we have that, then we start building. So the next thing is shoulder control. We don't want to stick just to give to the bit for too long because really we give to the bit. We're only really working the horse's head and neck. And the horse's head and neck for me, it's a, it's a bit like the, the handbag of the horse. You know, it's like an accessory. I really want to control the feet. First the front and then the back. So, you know, really, if I was working a horse, like if I, if I let's say I had a new horse, um, I might spend five or 10 minutes working just give to the bit. And then I would start controlling the feet. So really, then I would go to shoulder control. The shoulder control has two components. The first one is same rein, same foot, which is follow your nose. So bend left, travel left. So if we imagine a clock under the horse's chest and we're on standing on the left-hand side, we're only holding the left rein, the horse's head and neck is bent to the left and we can move the horse um, from 9.30, 10, 11, 12, one and two with that left front foot. And that's what shoulder control is all about, being able to move the horse, just the horse's shoulders. And what happens when you start this, you, you've already, your horse is already soft because you've been doing give to the bit. And the horse then mentally connects the um, position of that rein with the position of the foot. And so you can open the rein and the left foot will step left. You can close the rein on the neck and the left foot will step to the right. And again, we're moving forward. We're always moving forward. So when you're doing that, it's worth looking down at your horse's feet when you're doing reverse arc and just making sure that the horse is in fact stepping one foot in front of the other foot, not behind, because that makes a big difference to the horse. It might not make a big difference to us. It might seem like a really little thing, but we don't, don't want the horse backing up until much later on. We really need to establish forward first. Because it's very important that we get the horse moving forward in self-carriage before we start backing it up. So what you'll find when you, when you start with the um, shoulder control work is your horse is going to feel like it's getting a little bit heavier. So you think, oh, hang on, my horse was really light before. Now it feels a bit heavier. But what, the horse would only think of one thing at a time. And I know we like to think we can think of lots of things at a time because we're such good multitaskers, but we're not. We're terrible multitaskers. And um, so are the horses. So they can only think of one thing at a time. And what you'll find is the horse, when you first start to teach shoulder control, say you want to teach reverse art, and the horse will go, oh, I know this left foot step left yep i can do this i think no no that's not what i want i wanted you as left foot step right and the horse you know just has to understand just has to learn the new thing and so what will happen is he'll forget to give to the bit he'll forget his softness for a minute he'll work on the new thing mentally and he'll get that and then at the end of that you're going to have much better softness much better self-carriage and everything will come along together because you started with that foundation. But don't worry when you, when you think you're losing something because it will come back, it will come back in spades. So work through that because it's one of those learning curves, isn't it? Horses don't start here and then get progressively better at all. Horses start here, they get better, and then they get worse, and they get better, and then they get worse, and better and worse. And what happens is we quite often put them away a bit early so the horse starts here and they get better. And quite often this first learning curve is luck. Quite often the horse just got lucky, just moved his foot in the right direction a couple of times and wasn't really making that connection. And we say, oh, he's learned it. 
put him away, bring him out the next day and you get, no, it doesn't, it doesn't know it. Stupid horse. You know? But we haven't worked through that. You know, the horse hasn't probably made enough mistakes. So, the, you know, if the horse can make a few mistakes, well, it doesn't need to make many, depending on the horse, depending on its um, training history, but make a few mistakes so it can see, oh, that wasn't the right answer. That wasn't the right answer. That wasn't, oh, that is, oh, okay. Maybe I'll try that one again. And depending on what the horse is learning and the horse's emotional level, it's very hard to say, you know, I get asked a lot, you know, how many repetitions, well, how many good repetitions with the emotional level, right? At what stage of the learning curve? You know, there are a lot of things that come into play, but um, certainly if your emotional level is right, you won't need as many repetitions. If your emotional level is too high, you will need even fewer repetitions, but they should be good. They better be good because if they're not, your horse is going to learn fast here. The problem is horses do learn from fear. A lot of people use fear as a motivator and pain um, and they do learn very fast. So if your horse is too emotional, it, it might be fearful. It might be in pain. We don't know at this stage. I'm just, as an example, if the horse is too emotional, it will be learning very fast. So if your repetitions aren't good, that can end up being really dangerous quite fast. So that's why it's important to have your horse firstly relaxed and in the engagement zone, and then you can play with the emotions within there. Okay, so as soon as it comes out and your emotional level is too high, you need to bring it back to the engagement zone. And you only want to go up with 10, 10%, 10 or 15%, up and down, um, not 20%. You know, if your horse is a 50 normally in the paddock, 50 out of 100 average horse, you to train, you want to go you know, up to a 60 to 65 and then back down to a 55. 60, 50, 60, 50, 60, like this, rather than going way up, get up to 70, you need to regroup, come back to the engagement zone. So I think that's, that's really important. Now, a lot of other people ask me why I start with the shoulders. Now, I've got four feet. I could start with the hindquarters. And a lot of people do start with the hindquarters. But there's good reason, I feel, to start with the shoulders. And um, there's a few reasons, but the, the main one is that it's a more natural movement for the horse. So if you look at a horse in a paddock, if it changes direction, it doesn't move its hindquarters around, it moves its shoulders around. So if you watch your horse in the paddock changing direction, you will see that the shoulders move around the hindquarters. And if you, if you look again, look again at some um, trainers and the way they get the horse to change direction, there's some really obvious ones uh, with liberty work or work on a long line and see how they change direction. What you'll find is that horse disengages its hindquarters or steps its hindquarters um, laterally around the shoulders to change direction. And it's quite an unnatural movement for the horse to do. And it's also quite an energy expensive movement for the horse to do. And if you do that a lot, like a lot of disengage in the hindquarters, you're, you are likely to do some damage to your horse's back. So I, I really do try and avoid that. So for me, I go with the shoulders because I can get directional control with the shoulders. The big difference with taking control of the shoulders um, and the big difference you'll find once you start doing this with your horse. And I don't know how many of you, I know a lot of you are in the gold membership. So I don't know how many of you are, have actually started the shoulder control, how you're getting on with it, but a really great exercise to do once you start it. And once you get a bit of an idea is to um, draw it, Draw a pattern in the sand in your arena, if you have an arena, like I do with like a great big sort of figure eight and just and with a stick, just draw, draw a big figure eight in your arena. Now, take your horse. What I want you to do is get, um, look at the, the left rein and the left bit. You can see that, you can see it from when you're sitting in the saddle. And I want you to ride the horse over that line with the left bit on the line. This is great exercise. So you ride the figure of eight or whatever your pattern is, and you, you have to make sure that the left bit is on top of the line the whole way around. Then ride the pattern again. And this time, have the horse's, the middle of the horse's neck going over that line. 
I want you to write it the third time. The third time you write it, I want your belly button to go over the line. And I don't care what the horse's frame is, any of this, any of this. I want you to think about and work out what the difference is and, and how it feels each time. You'll find that one of those ways, um, the horse needs a ton of correction. One way is really hard. Um, which one is it going to be? The first one, second one, or the third one? Fingers. You don't know? No? Okay. The third one, you reckon? Okay, you got to do it. You got to do it. You got to do it. Um, I might, like, I might get you guys to do it because it is such a good thing. Um, and one is going to be really easy. Most people ride the first one because just generally, most people point the horse's nose in the direction they want it to go and hope the horse follows that. Um, unfortunately, horses don't actually follow their nose very often if you watch them in the paddock. Um, so that will, you, that will be the hardest one. What you'll find, that first one, is you have to correct the horse constantly. It is really hard to get that left bit over that line the whole time. The second one's going to be easier because you're getting more towards the middle of the horse. So the neck. The third one, when you're riding yourself over there, you don't have to worry about the handbag at the front. You just have to worry about the feet. And the third one, you'll find really easy. So give it a go because I really like to get your feedback on that. The first time I did that, I was absolutely mind blown because I was with you. I thought the third one sounded the hardest, but the first one is really hard. And then when you consider that is what most people are doing, this is why, you know, coming back to this, controlling the feet is so important. Um, good. Anyway, so then the next thing on our diagram, we go on to long reining. Now, I like to get at least some shoulder control before I start with the long reining. It's not absolutely necessary. Um, and one of the drawbacks with long reining is that you can't actually control the shoulders. So, you know, I'm always going on about long reining, about how useful it is and everything, but it has some major drawbacks. But I do think that, you know, as long as we know that those drawbacks exist, it's still a fabulous training tool. So um, long reining is great. Now, what's the difference between that and lunging? Well, basically that the horse is traveling in frame and in self carriage um, and building top line. So, you know, a lot of people, we, when we start a horse, if a young horse, we're building muscle. Now I always want to be building the muscles that I want the horse to use in the future. It doesn't really make any difference to the horse, which muscles I build. Now, if I let the horse go around um, with its head in the air and its back hollow and just in its sort of natural, whatever natural posture it might have, I'm going to be building muscles. I'm going to be building all those muscles under its neck. It's going to be pulling itself forward um, with its shoulders and oh, I'm going to be building all of those muscles. Mm, I, that's okay, but I could actually start building the muscles I want to use and I could that would benefit the horse because when I put the saddle on the horse and I sit on the horse, that he's going to need those muscles. I mean, the problem is with the horse, the horse carries, naturally the horse carries 60% of his weight on his shoulders and 40% on his hindquarters. And then I go and sit on him, which further compounds that problem because I sit on his shoulders. And then I say, right horse, now that I've done this to you, I want you to get your hindquarters underneath you oops, and, um, and elevate your shoulders. And the horse goes, well, I can't do that. <laughs> so, you know, if I've um, benefited the horse by actually building that top line first, it's much easier for the horse to then do it. So it's much easier, you know, if it's much easier for the horse, the horse is much more likely to um, want to give that a try and to want to get involved with training. So that's a, that's a huge benefit. And I think probably one of the biggest benefits to long reining is the building of that top line muscle. A lot of people then say, well, actually I, um, I lunge with side reins. So the horse is in frame, so I am building it. Mm. Side reins are really um, 
a very blunt training tool. And what usually happens with anything that ties the horse's head down is the moment you take it off, you get even more head elevation. The horse goes, well, I'm free, <laughs> and up its head goes. And so side reins and draw reins will usually actually teach the horse to raise its raise its head and not lower its head um, and be more tense than relax. The reason it builds tension is because usually the horse will fight against that. So lean on it. And you can't tell if side reins, if your horse is in frame, you can't tell whether or not they're leaning on the reins. So when you get on, if you require, you know, 20 kilograms of pressure in each rein to hold the horse in frame. Well, that's because that's what your side reins taught the horse to do. Um, so yeah, they, they are, it is a very blunt thing. So I like the long reins because you, you have one rein in each hand. So you can see the horse's frame and posture and you can feel its lightness and you can give, which you can't do when the horse is tied down. So you can give and the horse gets a release. It doesn't get a, perfect release which is another drawback from long reining but it gets a good release and it gets a better release than it will with anything else so um that that is really useful again you know the difference between that and lunging especially if you're lunging on one rein if you want your horse to have a run around and a bit of exercise um lunging is good for that but you're not going to be building the muscles you want to build um, so if you want to educate your horse and stick two reins on and go the long reining route, it's a little bit more work to teach, but the benefits are huge. I think we need to remember as well with this, you know, horses repeat whatever they practice. So whatever they repeat, they're going to do again. And it doesn't really matter whether you're on the horse's back or not, or whether you're at home or whether you're at the show. If you have a routine, horses love patterns. They're great pattern learners. If your routine involves having a horse on a 20 foot line, saddle up, put it on 20 foot line, spin it around both directions, let it have a buck and a fart. When you get on, those behaviors are still there because you've just in, taught the horse those behaviors. So you, you know, it may or may not present those behaviors under saddle, but if we're teaching the horse who are using pressure release, the horse is developing a shopping list of behaviors. So every time it feels a new pressure, it's got a shopping list, it can run down that shopping list of behaviors. So oh, I wonder if that step left, oh, I wonder if that's moved my hindquarters. Ah, oh, I wonder if that's bucked like a lunatic. Um, so know that you're adding it to the list. I know that when I teach my horses on purpose to rear, it's a mistake, you know, don't do it. <laughs> um, so whatever you teach know that it's going on that list so that's why I like to start with the shoulders and the long reining um, now long reining is also great because you because you can see and feel the horse you know if it's ready to ride or not like I won't ride a horse that isn't traveling in frame in walk trot and canter and maintaining posture and softness through transitions I don't care whether it's, you know, some great dressage horse or um, a new start. If it can do that, I'll ride it. If it can't do that, I won't ride it. Um, and the reason is because I know that I can't. I know that I can ride anything that I can see like that. Anything that stays relaxed during, you know, the transition to walk, trot and canter, maintains frame, softness and posture, then I can ride that. I really know I can. Um, and anything that doesn't, I, do, I don't know what else is in there. So I don't care whether it's a highly trained dressage horse um, or whether it's a, you know, new start. It's very important. So again, I don't think it makes a difference to the horse, whether you're on it or whether it's on the ground. The horse is working through a pattern that the horse knows. If the horse has already been ridden, so habituated to having a rider, then whether you're in the middle of the circle and long reining it, or whether you're on its back, shouldn't make a difference. The horse is working the same pattern, which is why you know it's so important that our cues are as similar on the ground when we're starting the horses as they are under saddle. You know, keep your rein at that same angle when you're doing uh, give to the bit as it will be so we don't have to reteach the horse, make it much easier. So after I've got that long reining and I know that I've got walk, trot and canter and the transitions are good, um, then I go to hindquarter control. 
So you see, I get all that forward before I start the hindquarter control. And the hindquarter control is an easy lesson for the horse, but quite a confusing lesson for the riders I often find. Um, the reason is, is because we're, we're so used to controlling the hindquarters with our legs as riders. You know, we put the leg on, we push the horse over. Well, there's, there's a couple of problems with that. One is that horses actually really don't like leg much. And I, up until, up until the last stage, I use leg, both legs go forward. So I use a verbal cue first for go forward or go faster. And then I touch with my leg, both legs together. And then I touch with the whip or raise the whip or lift the whip. And, and then I tap with the whip, my fourth cue. But I always start with the verbal one and then a touch of the leg. And by touch, I mean touch, you know, not a squeeze or a kick or anything. I just touch. They should be able to respond to that. They can feel that. And that's what I want the cue to be. Nothing heavier than that. Um, so if we're – the other problem with, um, with controlling the hindquarters with your leg is that when you think about um, the horse's barrel – Let's have the horse here. And we want the horse to move its hindquarters this way, okay? So if I was to put my leg on here to push the hindquarters that way, that would work, yeah? And what that should do is um, stretch the barrel out like that, yeah? So the, horses, the horse should get bigger on this side of its barrel and shorter on this side. Does that make sense? Yeah, okay. What actually happens in reality when we use legs, and if you think about it, think about um, yourself with a rider on your back. What happens when the rider puts leg on one side? What do you do to that side? Do you, you shorten it. Don't you actually shorten it? Because if somebody jabs you in the side, you, you go down to that. So with the horse, when, I'm, when I put my hand here, that side of the barrel isn't going to lengthen. It's going to shorten. Yes, the horse will move its hindquarters, but it's not going to be a nice movement. So that's why I do it. That's why I teach it off the rein. So I've already got self-carriage. I've already got softness. And now I introduce a new rein cue. So you'll find, you know, you, you can move the hindquarters like that, but you have to use more and more pressure, plus the horse is shortening its barrel on the wrong side. Um, or you can pick up one rein. If I pick up the right rein, the hindquarters move left very easily, very softly. And so you can do that quite quickly. This is why it's a confusing lesson for the people. It's really easy for the horse because if you move the horse's head right, the hindquarters go left. That's easy, easy. You know? And we sit up there and we go, oh, my God, which way am I going? So when, when we get to that, just, just relax. Don't worry. It's okay. We'll do it. It's good. So then what that gives me is it gives me shoulders from the um, – shoulders from the rein and hindquarters from the rein. So I've got the whole horse controlled from the reins, which makes the whole horse light and easy to ride. Um, and I can move the two things independently, which is the most important thing to get to lateral work, which is the last place we go with the foundation training. So you need to be able to have independent control of the front and the back of the horse to do lateral work. If you don't, so let's say I want to half pass. So I'm cantering down the centre line. I'm bent to the left. Okay. And I want the horse to step across to the left. So I'll put on my right leg and the horse should move off to the left. That's great. Now, that's the first time I use one leg at a time. So it's the first time the horse has felt one leg. And I was like, oh, what's that? You need one leg. Um, and if the horse doesn't understand what that is, I know that I can move his shoulder with my left rein. I can open the left rein. The shoulder will go left. Ah, and I've got my right rein. Do you remember I said the right rein will move the hindquarters to the left? Yeah? So my right rein will move his hindquarters to the left. So I've got... I can put the leg on if the horse doesn't understand that cue or it leaves his hindquarters behind. I pick up that right rein and I move the hindquarters left. And it's a really, really simple way for the horse to get that, to, under, um, to move all of, his, all of his feet together, which is great. And it makes it really easy for the horse. So what happens is we get there 
in relaxation because we built on each of those things. So the other beauty of controlling the hindquarters separately when we get to lateral work is that in order to engage one hindquarter, so let's say we want to pick up the left lead canter, we need to engage the left hind. Or if we want to do flying changes, we need to be able to talk to the hindquarters and keep the shoulder still. Let's say we're cantering to the left and we want to do a flying change to the right. Okay. The, um, the engaged hindquarter, when we're cantering to the left, is the left hind. And that's coming further under the horse than the right. So all we need to do for a flying change, because the change comes from the back of the horse, all we need to do is swap over that engaged hind. So we need to swap it to, we need to engage the right hind. Now, in order to do that without pushing the horse over, like throwing the horse over, picking up the right rein and just moving the shoulders, is we only want to talk to hindquarters, we want to keep the shoulders still. Because we know that if the horse changes leg behind, it will also change in front. You very rarely, very rarely, unless your horse has got a real lameness issue, it won't only change behind. But you often see horses only changing in front and that's because their shoulders have been thrown over to the other side and they haven't spoken to the hindquarters. But if we can keep the shoulders still with our rein, and we can lift the other, we can lift the left rein, which is going to move the hindquarters right and the horse will change lead like that. And we just set up some easy patterns for the horse. We never get that, you know, sliding your legs all over the horse and the tail swishing and all of that sort of thing, because it's a nice light aid and the horse has got that foundation in lightness and in self-carriage and the horse understands independent hindquarter control. So, you know, I do quite often when you, when I put out something like the flying changes video, everyone wants to do, Oh, I want to do that. Yeah, I want to do that. But they're, they're coming in up here, you know, the, there's, there's no point. It's only going to confuse your horse. If, you, if you're teaching this off the rein, you need your horse to be light. You need your horse to be responsive. You need to have independent hindquarter control before asking. Then it's a simple exercise. But if it's not, if you haven't got that, it's a real slog to get this um, without all these, all these things first. And it's really not fair on the horse. So that's, that's why I have the progression in the way that we do. Um, and that's really the rest of our course. For those of you that are in the gold membership now, we are up to long reigning, I think, long reigning, yeah. Um, so we're halfway there, which is absolutely fabulous and very exciting. Um, and what you'll find with your horses is remember this. I just want you to remember the learning curves. They're going to get better. And then you think, oh, my God, oh, it's getting so awful. But next time they have a good one, it'll be better than it was before. It goes up like this, but it, it's, not, it's not linear. Okay. Anyway, so I will see you this afternoon. But thank you very much for coming to this webinar. Um, I'm going to now see if I can turn you all your microphones on. Oh, I can. Anybody got any questions? Yeah, in the chat. it's Susan, Kate. Oh. Go ahead, Kathy. Susan, you go because Kathy's just turned herself off. Oh, okay. I don't, I don't know why we don't have video. No, nor do I. But you can hear me. Okay. I can hear you. Um, when you were talking about short, shoulder control and you were talking about how they should step across in front of their other foot not behind yeah but what do we do if they step behind oh just ask them forward susan so the one of the things with shoulder control is it is very important to have forward before you ask for reverse arc so if you do find your horse is stepping behind, just get more same rein, same foot, get the horse going around you, relax, then ask for another step of reverse arc. Good question. Yeah, yeah. Just go forward again and ask again. I've, wherever you can, avoid correcting the horse because it just, it's, it's counterproductive. You're much better off just finding another place that you can praise the horse. Um, yeah, good question. Okay. Thank you.
Kathy, did you have a question? Good. All right. We all set then. No questions. Um, I've got one, Kate. Yeah. Tracy. Sorry. Other Tracy, are you going? Um, with, I've started long reining my mare and I want her, like, when you go from the walk with one cluck and then trotting with two clucks, when she's trotting and I want her to walk, if I give one cluck, she thinks I mean go faster. So do I just? Yeah, I use I use the um, sounds, the clucking and the kissing, for upward transitions. Yeah. And I'll use voice um, like words for downward. So I'd go and walk. Oh, that's and good. Walk. Yeah, yeah. And I sort of stand down like that. Yeah. I, oh, I know that's good because she will respond to I and walk. But yeah. I yeah, thought it's a nice idea, but it's not, it, it's not distinct enough, I think, for, yeah. for the horse. Yeah. So yeah. when you're in gate, so let's say you're in trot, and I'll use, I'll, I'll cluck. I mean, the thing about walk is it's just one. Trot, I've just got more than one. So if the horse doesn't trot, I just keep clucking. Yeah. Um, and when you're in trot, cluck if you want faster trot. So, yeah. Yeah. Or if you're in canter, kiss if you want more canter, faster canter. Yeah. Yeah, yeah, but yeah, good question. Oh, that's great. Thank you for explaining that because I was thinking it was meant to be just one cluck to come down and she's like, what are you clucking for? She's going faster, yeah. <laughs> <laughs> I don't understand. No, she didn't. Yeah, no, I think, it, I think it's easier. And for us as well, it's a more of a, mm -hmm, slow down. Right. Good. Mm -hmm. Good. Okay. So it for questions. Oh, you're an easy lot this morning. We are. Well, I might throw in one. It's the... Oh. Yeah. Hi, Kate. Um, Hi. Me... Hi. Uh, when you were talking about shoulder control, which I'm not up to yet, um, yep. you also mentioned something, and I just uh, I didn't get the whole story. You mentioned something about you sitting on the front of the horse, which is like 60% of pressure, and there was you mentioned somehow you could uh, you could do damage. To the, the back of the horse and I didn't quite understand what you mean oh okay well first of all I think I think two different things what I said first of all was the horse naturally carries 60% its weight on its shoulders and 40% on its hindquarters then I said we compound that problem by sitting on its shoulders the um, the damage I find a lot of disengaging the hindquarters. That's a really hard movement for the horse. It really stretches out its back legs. If you, you know, really if you move your horse's head around a lot to the right, that hindquarters steps across to the left with some really big steps, and it's not a natural movement for the horse. They don't do that on their own. They only do that when they're forced to do that. It's so any movement that the isn't natural for the horse is unlikely to do it a lot of good. So I think that it's a mistake to do too much disengaging the hindquarters in that way, which is one reason why I leave hindquarter control till later. And it's the very reason that I never change direction by moving the hindquarters instead of the shoulders. I think any extreme movement like that, the horses don't make themselves um, normally is dangerous. It's a, it's a bit like um, the, you know, you quite often see um, people putting the horse's nose on their knee, you know, they're called flexing, get the horse to flex and goes round like this, round like this. Around. And, you know, I mean, that cannot be good for the horse's neck. There's, there's no way. And it's not something you ever see the horse doing. Yes, they can. They can do it. They can scratch their tummy, but they don't spend their entire time going around with their head facing backwards i mean that's just because they can do it doesn't mean it's something they need to do repeatedly um and it's not something we ever want them to do when we're riding either and so as soon as you do something repetitively like that it's really likely to cause the horse some pain which again is something we don't want to do um and then you'll get things like you people say to me, oh, but I, I teach um, 
emergency stops or one round stops. Yeah. Don't do that. Don't do that. I mean, honestly, if you, if you feel the need to teach your horse an emergency stop, don't get yeah. on. <laughs> you, oh, wow. You know, you should not be riding a horse that you might need to emergency stop. It's way too dangerous. Um, and, you know, it, it's so easy to pull a horse over. You know, if you absolutely have to do, if your horse is bolting, um, hello, take up seat. one round and stop the horse, but expect it to fall over as well. Um, yeah. But yeah. that might be the better thing than going under the bus. Hmm? No, oh, didn't, your number didn't come up. Okay. <laughs> yes. Sorry, I didn't get that. <laughs> oh, somebody's phone's ringing. <laughs> oh. <laughs> yeah, I was thinking the same about the run, one rain stop. This exact, yeah, exactly. It's not a natural movement. No. And it's so severe, you know, so it really severe. worries me. Yeah. And the yeah. idea of practicing it just um, blows my mind. <laughs> Why are we maybe in a real emergency situation? But we all, you know, sometimes we have to do crazy things in an emergency situation. But honestly, um, you know, if you, yeah. if you ever have a horse that, that needs to be taught that, then... Um, Yep. <laughs> I'm hearing you. <laughs> good, good. All Thanks. right. We all set? Yep. Excellent. Excellent. Well, I'll see you. Um, gosh, I can't remember. It won't be next week because I think next week is Christmas. But um, I'll see you the week after that for this regular webinar. And those of you that are gold members, I will see you, I hope, this afternoon for our chat about long raining yeah. what time is that Kay? i think it's at 6 p.m sydney time yeah. whenever that might be does that does that make it an hour earlier than our previous meeting yeah probably yeah okay so one in the morning for me instead of two. One in the morning, Susan. That'll be convenient. It'll be a breeze. <laughs> <Yeah. laughs> I will. Now. <laughs> Don't worry. It'll be it'll be recorded because you only forget to record once. Trust me. I forgot once and I had to remake the whole thing. So um, yeah, it will be recorded and it will be popped up there um quickly anyway i will i will talk to you then those of you that i see then otherwise i'll see you in a couple of weeks right thanks guys bye, bye. 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 bye.